Philippians chapter 1, start reading in verse 27 into chapter 2, <clears throat> verse 11. Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear of you, that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. In no way alarmed by your opponents, which is a sign of destruction for them, but of salvation for you, and that too from God. For to you it has been granted for Christ's sake, and not only to believe in Him, but also to suffer for His sake. Experiencing the same conflict which you saw in me, and now here to be in me. Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Doing nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which is also in Christ Jesus. Although who existed in the form of God did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father." take you to Philippians this morning because I wanted to focus on <clears throat> the issue of Christ and you know we come to this time of the season and we sort of set this time aside as a church to reflect on the birth of Christ <clears throat> and we really attempt to keep Christ in focus this time of the year and and it, it's poignant especially because when you look at things around us now there's so many who are trying to remove Christ from Christmas there's so many who are trying to distract us and to divert our attention away from that which is crucial and that which is important, really that which is why we celebrate this time of the year, and that is the coming of Jesus Christ and all that He has brought about for us. <clears throat> but I really, this morning, I want to challenge you to stay focused on Christ, but not just at this time of the year, but to stay focused on Christ throughout the year. I mean, really, it's, it's not just talking about He is the reason for the season. He is the reason for the entirety of our life. And some churches, it's interesting because they do. They sort of take this time aside. One church, uh, they, it was interesting because they decided that over the next couple Sundays, they weren't going to have worship service on Sunday, and they were going to designate those days of going out in the community and doing community service. And I'm thinking, well, why can't you be doing that during the week and still maintain worship on Sunday, right? I mean, is it that difficult to get together to worship on Sunday and then go out and serve the community? But I started thinking about this because we really do this. It's sort of like we set this time of the year aside, we focus on Christ, but we can, through the rest of the year, forget to focus on Him. And there's so many things that can distract us. And so really this morning, I would just challenge you to just keep, if you will, keep Christ in focus, and it's interesting because as I've walked through this passage, and we'll walk through it this morning, we'll look at this passage in Philippians, starting in chapter 1, verse 27. There are so many things that can distract us and, and to divert us away from focusing on Christ and keeping all of our attention on Him. I mean, we can think about the daily things of life, the things that we go through, the busyness of our schedules, all the things that come up. We can get caught up in work and all of those kinds of things that we have to do. And before you know it, by the end of the day, you realize that you really didn't give much thought to God throughout the day. There wasn't much focus on Christ at all through the day. There are so many things that can distract us, so many things that can come into our life, whether it's situations or even people. And sometimes even our relationship with Christ can lead us into a situation in which we're facing opposition because of our relationship to Christ. And when we enter into this situation, we can even find ourselves losing focus of Christ in the midst of that circumstance and focus upon the situation rather than upon Him and glorifying and magnifying Him in the midst of the situation we're in. 
We can do the same thing with relationships. We, we constantly are losing focus of Christ when it comes to our relationships with other people. And Paul's going to challenge us with these things, and I want to look at it this morning. It's just a challenge for all of us to keep Christ in focus. And want to walk through this passage together. We'll start in chapter 1, verse 27. <clears throat> But up here we deal with the issue of the thing that challenges every Christian, something that we all face, something that we're all going to struggle with, and that is our, our keeping our attention focused on Christ and not being distracted. And there are going to be things that come into our life that are going to distract us, and even these things are a part of God's plan. We realize that we live in a sinful world, and we realize that we are surrounded constantly by distractions. The thing is, is that we need to constantly remind ourselves we need to be focused on Christ. Everything that we do in life is really to magnify Christ. This is the statement that Paul makes in regards to his own life. Notice with me in chapter 1, verse 20. According to my earnest expectation, hope that I will not be put to shame in anything, but that with all boldness Christ will even now, as always, be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. I mean, that is, if you will, summing up life for us. It is to magnify Christ with our life. But again, sometimes we can get so caught up with the things that are happening, the relationships that we have, we lose focus of Christ, we lose focus of the real reason why we are here, and that is to magnify Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. And the challenge for us is not to be distracted, but the interesting thing is that when I was reading through this passage, one of the things we'll note is that, notice with me in chapter 1, verse 29. One of the things that was fascinating to me as I, I first started going through this passage sometime back was the statement in verse 29. For to you it has been granted for Christ's sake not only to believe in Him, but also to suffer for His name's sake. This to me was an amazing truth. Not only was it granted that we would believe in Christ, but also what? That we would suffer for His namesake. That part of the Christian life, there's going to be suffering. And I, for some reason, I think that there are some believers that don't realize that this is a reality of the Christian life. Paul says in, in Acts, when he goes around and he was encouraging the brethren, the disciples, and he was encouraging by the statement of, that through many trials and tribulations we will enter into the kingdom of God. You need to understand that a part of the Christian life is going to be suffering. There are going to be circumstances when we face opposition and it's going to rise up against us. And in the midst of those moments, we need to stay focused on Christ. That needs to be our objective is that we are going to glorify Him. Well, it's interesting because he's going to deal with the issue of the nature of suffering in chapter 1, verse 29. And the first thing is the fact that it was granted to us, and this term translated granted is really God graced us. God graced us not only with the ability to believe in Christ, but also to suffer for his namesake. Do you realize that suffering is a privilege that we have, and it is a gift from God? Now, I know most of us, when we would think about suffering in our life, the trials and tribulations we go through, we would sit back and go, there's nothing great about that. And sometimes we accept it and we say, okay, this is my lot in life and I understand that I'm going to go through this. But the challenge here is not to merely just accept it. It is to embrace it as a privilege. It's not a curse. It is a privilege that God gives us to suffer for the sake of Christ. I just was thinking on this statement, and I was reading it with my brother. We're just talking about this. It just is so stunning to me, and I have to read it again. And I just put it this way. The believer has been granted on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in Christ, but also to suffer on behalf of Christ. It's amazing because he starts off with the statement of on behalf of Christ. You see, even when we talk about the issue of belief, and so oftentimes we talk about our faith and our belief and our trust in Christ is such a personal thing, but it's on behalf of Christ that we've been granted this ability to believe in Him. It's all about Him. And it's interesting because when we come to chapter 2, notice with me in chapter 2, as it talks about the exaltation of Christ, for this reason, verse 9 of chapter 2, for this reason God highly exalted him, bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow, and those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. It's all about really, if you will, the magnification of Christ. It's all focused on Christ. It's on behalf of Christ that we've been able to believe in him, but also it's on his behalf that we suffer. 
And somehow we have to remember that, that it is a distinct privilege that we have to suffer for Christ. It's not a curse. And it's not just merely just resigning ourselves and saying, okay, this is my lot in life. I understand trials and tribulations. I'm going to have to do this. It's about embracing this is a privilege. I think in Acts chapter 5, verse 41, and I put this up here for you. In Acts 5.41, we had the, the, the apostles who were taken off and they appeared before the council and they were beaten, right, because they were giving testimony about Christ. And this statement was made as they walked away. So they went on their way from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for His name. It's interesting because over the last few months, we've been praying for the persecuted church. As a family, been trying to do that on a regular basis. The kids do it as a part of their, their daily devotion and time. The Lord is just praying for the persecuted church. We've gathered together with other believers on Sunday evenings to pray for the persecuted church. It's amazing. It's amazing the things that God's people are going through for the sake of the gospel of Christ, to magnify Christ. There are those right now, today, whose lives are being taken for the sake of their belief in Christ. And I really don't think we understand just what's happening worldwide to the church. And I really do believe that we live in the Disneyland of the world. We've got it so easy in America, it's unbelievable. And the church has sort of sat back and become apathetic in regards to its testimony about Christ. And it's not just about one season, it's about the entirety of our life. It's every single day, day in, day out, it's about magnifying Christ, whether it's at work, whether it's in the marketplace, whether it's in the home, it's all about Him. This is the only reason why we're here. So often we lose the focus, so often we take our eyes off of Him. And the challenge is to keep our eyes riveted on the fact that we are here for Christ. It's all about Him. I give you this thought, suffering comes in a time of battle for truth, and battle scars are inevitable. There's going to be conflict. I mean, even when we try to live out the principles in our home, you understand that there's even going to be conflict in our very homes, and we try to live according to the Word of God. There may come opposition, maybe not in our immediate family, but within the context of family, opposition will come. It's just a natural thing when you try to live according to what God wants you to do. Those who strive to live godly lives, 2 Timothy chapter 3, are going to be persecuted. They're going to suffer. This is a part of the reality of Christianity. But in the midst of these adverse circumstances, we have to remember why we're in them. It's all about magnifying Christ. It's all about uplifting His name. I give you this thought, as much as God has chosen our lot as Christians, that lot is most often filled with fire. Robertson makes this statement, I have chosen thee in the furnace of affliction. See, somehow we have to realize the fact that suffering is a part of the Christian life. It's a part of our experience. It's a grace gift from God. And it's opportunities for us to magnify the name of Christ. When you think about it, when you go through a difficult situation, usually our attention reverts to ourself. And usually we start throwing ourselves a nice little pity party. Woe was me and I can't believe I'm going through this and man, this is just tough on me and it just becomes me, 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 me. We need to realize that those times of trial and suffering are opportunities for us to magnify Christ, to exalt Him, to lift Him up, that we decrease while He, what, increases. It's all about Him. But so often, when we have those difficult moments in life and situations, it's all about us. And we whine and we kick and we stomp our feet. And we lose focus on the whole reason of why we're even here. Somehow we have to remember that this is the reality of the Christian life. This is why we are here. And it's interesting because Paul, he talks about the fact that there is going to be suffering in verse 29. And he recognizes the fact that, look, you're not the only ones in this. Notice verse 30. Experiencing the same conflict which you saw in me and now here to be in me. You're not alone in this. I suffer as well. You're going to have conflict. And an interesting thought, though, that the struggle is common. There's one common agona that we all have as believers. It is a common struggle that we all have. This is why, to me, it was, it's amazing because, you know, when we started praying for the, the persecuted church, and it was interesting because the first time we gathered together with these believers, I didn't even know any of them. 
uh, until the, the night we gathered together, which to me was just an awesome experience. That you can gather together as the family of God, and you could come in with a whole lot of you know speculative accusations, whatever you know, because you don't know these people, and you know start just sort of picking away at their life and what they say and all that kind of stuff. To me, it was great. You just walk in. We were just the family of God getting together, praying, praying for the church. To me, it was so refreshing. So often you feel like in a Christian life, people are just nitpicking everything about your life and you just feel like you're in that fishbowl and they're just scrutinizing everything you do. And it was nice just to gather with God's people and pray and there was no inhibition. No one was hung up on anything. It was just there to pray. But it was interesting because one of the common things that I kept hearing in the prayers all around was the, the lack of realization of what was happening in the church that people just didn't realize. But it was awesome because they were also embracing the fact that we get to share in the suffering with these other believers. We may not be able to be there, but we can pray for them. We can get on our knees and we can petition on their behalf. And we can struggle with them, if you will, in prayer for them. You know, Paul can say oftentimes, I, I may not be with you in body, but I'm with you in spirit. And it's a beautiful thing because of the unity that we have in the spirit, that we can have this kind of relationship, that we can do that, that we can partake of this agona together, this struggle. And there is a common struggle that we all have as believers. Now, there may be unique areas in our individual lives and in times that we have struggle, and there may be differences of our circumstances. Paul's circumstance may be different from our circumstance, but the agona is the same. In other words, theologically they're the same, but the circumstances can differentiate. You know, for some of our homes, everything's great. And we're all living out the principles of God's Word together, and everything's cool. In other homes, it's not that way. In the marketplace, sometimes, you know, we, there are those who just don't have this conflict. There are those who have conflict. Workplace, maybe you're facing opposition because you're a believer in the workplace. And it varies and it differs, but understand this. This is the same going. It's the same struggle. It is a common struggle that we all have, and it's all about magnifying Christ in the midst of it. But the beautiful thing is Paul says you're not alone. And the manner of this suffering, Paul lays it out for us. It's interesting because he'll deal with the suffering from without, the suffering in circumstances. In chapter 1, verses 12 and following, notice with me, Now I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel, so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Garden to everyone else, and that most of the brethren, trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment, have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. There is this external persecution or suffering that Paul is going through. This is the circumstance. He is in prison because of his faith. And he is suffering this external circumstance, if you will, and he is in the midst of persecution. But it's not only that, because he's also suffering within himself, because he's trying to deliberate, am I going to live, am I going to die? In verse 20, he talks about the fact, whether by life or by death, all I want is that Christ is to be exalted. But there is this external suffering that's going to come. And he warns the church, notice with me, chapter 1, verse 28, understand this, in no way be alarmed by your opponents. Understand this, I am suffering the circumstance, I have external opposition, this is the situation I I mean, understand you are going to face the same thing. We are going to find ourselves in adverse circumstances that are going to challenge us, and we need to embrace those moments to see them as a gift from God, as an opportunity to magnify Christ. I mean, you think about this. Paul sitting in prison, he was wrongly accused. He didn't, he didn't do anything wrong to get there. He was falsely accused about taking someone into a part of the temple. He wasn't supposed to take him. It was assumed that he did so. So he's hauled off by the soldiers. He's mistreated. He's in Caesarea in prison there for, for several years. Then he's off and he take, they finally get him to Rome after he takes his whole ship trip all the way over there. He gets to Rome and there he's under house arrest. He's, he's chained to a soldier 24-7. All of this because of something he didn't do. He was unjustly accused of something. So here he's sitting in prison. Now on top of that, okay, on top of that now, you have this trial that's going on in regards to his life, he doesn't know the outcome of it, but on top of that now you have believers that are persecuting his life. Notice with me in chapter 1, verses 15 and following. Some to be sure are preaching Christ even from envy and strife, but some also from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition rather than from pure motives, thinking to cause me distress in my imprisonment. It isn't just merely this external circumstances, it's internal stuff dealing with relationships. So not only do I have the world attacking me, not only am I on trial before the world, I also have believers, those who are part of the body of Christ, the family of God, and they're trying to cause me more 
insult to injury, if you will. They're trying to cause affliction for me while I'm in prison for the faith. Now think about this, because Paul could sit there in the midst of this situation and throw himself a really big pity party. And we would say he has every right to do so. Falsely imprisoned, I mean, all the stuff that he go through, all the trials that he went through, he finally gets to Rome. Here he's sitting in prison there, and now he's suffering at the hands of believers that were trying to bring more affliction upon him while he's sitting in prison. He has every reason and right. In our minds, humanly speaking, he has every right to throw himself a pity party. But the question is, is that what he does? And the answer is no, because he didn't allow his circumstances to cloud his focus and divert him away from the true focus of life, and that is magnifying Christ. His whole attention was riveted on Christ through this whole situation. And he's going to challenge us with these statements that come from him. Chapter 1, verse 21. We know the statement very well. <clears throat> and the thing that he's going to challenge us with is the issue of being singular in mind in regards to our circumstances. But notice this, chapter 1, verse 21. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. This is it. I mean, to me, I, over this last year, I've really been thinking about this statement and really evaluating because is this my ethic for life? Could I really say this about my life? For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. I mean, this is emphatically put. He is stressing his faith is unshakable regarding the circumstances. You can't shake it. I'm not going to be diverted. My focus is going to remain on Christ no matter what happens to me, no matter what anyone does to me, no matter the circumstances or the relationships, no matter how adverse they come, I am going to stay focused on Christ. I'm going to be singular in mind. But I challenge myself with this because you think about this, right? If dying, and, and this is from my father, if dying is not gain, then living is not Christ. You see, the amazing thing about Paul is he was so focused on that prize. And we talk about being eschatologically minded. He was heavily minded. Notice with me in chapter 3. Notice with me in chapter 3, you start in verse 12. Not that I've already obtained it yet, I have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which I was also laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, I keep reaching forward to what lies ahead. I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. I keep moving on. I keep looking forward to the end. You see, for Paul... Ultimately, he wanted to be with Christ so badly. I mean, that's why he vacillated in chapter 1. I don't know if, it's, if I should live or die. I don't know what's going to happen. If I had my preference, I would rather be dead. I would rather go because I would be with the Lord. I don't know that I could say that today. I would like to think I could say that. I would like to think that I want to be out of this sinful world so bad, and I want to be in the presence of my Lord and Savior so bad. Take me now, Lord, take me now. You see, that's a life that's riveted on Christ. That is a life that is so focused on Him that everything in life is going to be driven by that one focus. You see, if dying is gain, if it means being in the presence of Christ, then life is going to be Christ. The problem for most of us, though, is we know that dying is not gain, and therefore living isn't Christ. And we're not magnifying Him as we ought to magnify Him. There's so many things that hold us here. We, we do this. We stake ourselves to this earth. We allow things to come in our life. We bring things into our life that are going to stake us to this earth, that keep us from focusing on where we need to focus. Paul was so focused on Christ that this is where he wanted to be and he vacillated, but he knew, hey, if I stay here, I know it's going to be about your benefits. And amazing because in chapter 1, he is talking about these circumstances and the adverse effects that are, are coming because of these believers and so on. But all of a sudden, he moves away from these ill-willed preachers and he's just focusing on the glory of Christ. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. You see, it's almost as though I'm just not even conscious about my circumstances anymore. This is what it's all about right here. That Christ, even now, as always, as always, would be magnified, whether by life or by death. 
should be tattooed on all of our hearts, shouldn't it? This is the thing that should drive us in life. It's all about Christ. But for some reason, we, we get distracted, we lose focus, we get so riveted on the situations we're in, the circumstances, we forget why we are in them. Christ was the motive for his action. I mean, you look at his whole entire life, read this epistle, Christ was the goal of his life. The three thoughts that come in chapter 3, I want to know Christ, I want to be like Christ, and then I want to be with Christ. And he even realized that the suffering was a part of his being conformed to Christ. Chapter 3, verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, notice this, and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. It's amazing the relationship that he has with Christ. I mean, you can tell, okay, in all the relationships that exist in the world, this is Paul's default relationship. This is it, right? It comes above everything else. The question I ask is, does, does the world see that in our life? Not just this time, this season, but do they see that every day of our life that that is the default relationship out of all relationships that we have. That He is supreme, and that's it. And that drives everything that we do. And we're willing to let go of everything, even this world, to be with Him. It's amazing because even for Paul, not only was he the motive for his action, the goal of his life, he was, if you will, the source of his power. This is how he could do the things that he can do. I mean, it's amazing because you look at the Apostle Paul and think, man, he's such a, I mean, a saint is just a warrior for the cause of Christ, but he did it all in the power of Christ. It was he who drew from him, if, if you will, all of his energy and the power and the ability. In Colossians chapter 1, when he talks about his ministry, admonishing every man, teaching every man, and he makes the point that he does it all in the power of God. It's not in his own ability, in his own doing. He is the source for everything in his life. And I just challenge you, it's just true. When you face something, where do you go? When you face a difficulty, if you have tension in a relationship, where's the first place you go? And where should be the only place that you go? And where should be the place that you abide until there's an answer to your supplication? I mean, really, it's interesting because my father has given this analogy in, in years past and talked about the fact that, you know, how would you feel as a parent and your children and they, your child needs a new pair of jeans and your child, instead of coming to you and saying, Dad, I need a, need a new pair of jeans, your child goes around the neighborhood knocking door from door asking them for something. This is what we do to God. This is what we do to Christ, Right? We go everywhere else, asking everywhere else, rather than going to Him. We read everyone else's book rather than His book. We go abide at someone else's feet rather than go to His feet. And it's amazing. We go through Ephesians and see all the things that God has provided for us in Christ. Why would we go anywhere else and draw from anyone else? And here's the question, really, because it's just an issue of this. Do you think that Christ is sufficient for your life? You know what? Paul thought that Christ was worth dying for. Paul thought Christ was worth living for. The question is, do we think that Christ is sufficient? Because when we start going somewhere else, rather than drawing from Him, we're saying, you're not enough for me. I need something else. What you have and offer is just not good enough. I need something that's going to really, it's going to minister to my need here and now. And he's saying, I've got it all. I've got it all. The other thing that Paul challenged with us is the issue of the selflessness of mind in regards to our relationships. Circumstances, we can say, all right, I can handle circumstances. I can handle opposition. I can handle those that, that are going to persecute me from outside. What about those from within? What about those that we have intimate relationships with? Paul's going to deal with in chapter 2, he's going to deal with the issue of the family of God. There's going to be conflict, and there is conflict. When you look at chapter 4, turn with me to Philippians chapter 4, there is conflict in this body. Paul gets to it later, but he's going to set all of the groundwork first before he actually gets to the issue at hand. 
And I think it's very fascinating. I really think, you know, the, the issue of this church in Philippi, they, they were mature enough that Paul could deal with this thing openly in this epistle that was going to be read publicly. They were mature enough to know that they could handle this. But it's interesting because in chapter 4, notice with me, I urge Yodia and I urge Syntyche to live in harmony in the Lord. Indeed, true companion, I ask that you also help these women who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel together with Clement, also in the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. There was tension in the body. There was, if you will, conflict. This is why Paul gets into these issues in chapter 2 is because he's setting the groundwork before he gets to this point of dealing with this. And by the time you get through all of these things, by the time he gets to during, dealing with the issue of the conflict, it's, it's going to be a no-brainer what they're supposed to do. But he draws on these in chapter 2. Notice with me chapter 2, verses 1 and following. Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete. He's dealing with the issue of internal relationships within the body of Christ. And he challenges them. I want you to have this kind of mindset that Christ had. Notice with me chapter 2, verse 5. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. He's not just talking here. When he uses this term for now, he's not just talking about a specific act of thought and a direction at a given point. He's talking about a disposition and attitude. And he's not going to just tell us, have this kind of attitude. The great thing for Paul is that he's going to give us some examples of what does this attitude look like? How does it flesh out in life? And so he's going to lay some examples for us. And the first one he's going to do is he's given an example of himself. Some of the Christian leaders, if you will. First, he's going to give himself as an example. Then he's going to give Timothy as an example. And then Epaphroditus as an example. Notice with me the Christ-like attitude of Paul, chapter 2, verse 17. Notice this statement. But even if I am being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I rejoice and share my joy with you all. Just listen to the selflessness of the statement that Paul is making here in regards to his own life. In regards to Timothy in chapter 2, verses 19 through 24, Paul makes a statement, For I have no one else of kindred spirit who will genuinely be concerned for your welfare. He's hoping to send Timothy to him to minister to them. And he says, there's just no one else who will care for you. I mean, it's almost that like Paul sends Timothy there, that it's going to be just the same as Paul was there himself. Timothy is going to be that concerned about them. But notice the selfless statements that come. He's going to be so concerned for you. The Christ-like attitude of Epaphroditus, your messenger and minister to my need because he was longing for you all and was distressed because you heard that he was sick. Epaphroditus was sent by the church in Philippi to minister to Paul while he was in Roman imprisonment. He got so sick that he almost died. And the amazing thing is that Epaphras was distressed. Paul mentions here in verse 26, he was distressed because they heard that he was so sick and he was distressed that they heard about it and they would be concerned over his welfare. I mean, sometimes you think about it, we get in a bad situation and, and someone expresses concern for us, and we just, oh, that's, that's nice. Isn't that nice? Epaphroditus didn't do that. Epaphroditus was distressed because of the fact that they would have been concerned for him and, and worried about him and his illness. He was more concerned with them than with himself. And he was sick unto the point of death. They had every reason to worry, but he didn't want them to worry. So that's selflessness. That is having this, if you will, this disposition that Christ had. And I give you some thoughts that come from these statements that come. We have the mightiness of Christ rendered unmindful of self in regards to Paul's life with Timothy's life. His unselfishness of mind and spirit rendered him useful in the Lord's service and dependable on the Apostle Paul's behalf. See, these men that can be used for the ministry, for the cause of Christ, they were so focused on Christ and so focused on others, their concern was not themselves, and it made them, rendered them useful for the ministry of God. Notice this, a testimony worthy of a servant of Christ and Epaphroditus. He combines faithfulness, tenderness, and service that is sacrificial and self-forgetful to the point of death. You see, he was there in Rome to minister to Paul, and he was there on his behalf, and he almost died in the process of doing this. You see, we take these thoughts and bring them into our personal relationships. There's conflict we have, right? There's tension that's going on. The question is, 
do we have the kind of attitude that we are supposed to have and the disposition we are supposed to have? It's interesting because Paul is going to challenge us in chapter 2, verse 3. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. Paul gives us these examples of these men, but they're all living a Christ-centered life. He is the ultimate example. And Paul gives us that example in chapter 2, verses 6 to 11. And quickly, I just want to look at that with you. And I render the NIV here. It's, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, or as the NASB has it. Have this attitude in yourselves, which also was in, in Christ Jesus. The overriding thought is outlook determines outcome. You see, if you're focused on Christ, if you're focused on the example and the disposition that Christ had, then when it comes to relationships, there isn't going to be that conflict. You're going to do everything you can to resolve that conflict. You're not going to be self-centered. You're going to be selfless and focused upon others. You're not going to be self-serving, but you're going to be about giving of yourself. I give you this thought, if one's attitude is selfish, then one's actions will be divisive and destructive. Now, we understand that when it comes to personal relationships, we can only answer for ourselves, can't answer for the other person. I can and, I can and must do everything in my ability all right, to make sure that I'm not acting in a selfish manner, that I'm acting in a selfless manner, that I'm looking out for the interests of someone else. I can't answer for them, and I can't change their attitude and actions. I just have to be sure that I do what I'm supposed to do. But if we're all doing what we're supposed to be doing, then we're all going to be mutually working towards each other's benefit, yes? But the challenge here is just for us to have the same attitude as Christ had. And, and truly, if you look at Philipp, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, notice what happens when you start looking at self. Paul starts off the list there in chapter 3, and he talks about the fact that one who is lover of self, and you look at all the list of those vices that flow out of that. Lovers of money, destruction of home, all of the things that flow out of that. The moment we start looking to ourself, it's going to bring nothing but divisiveness and destruction. The moment that I start looking out for my own rights and my own privileges and, and the things that I think I deserve and I become I, 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 me, 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 it's going to bring nothing but destruction. That's why it's crazy me in the world, right? I mean, we know that the, the, the world is like lost sheep. Everyone has gone astray, right? They've all gone their own way. And what we say to the world is, you know, everything's relative. Oh, truth is your truth. Whatever you want to do. And we say to them, you know what? Each man does unto his own. Whatever he wants to do, do what's pleasing in your own eyes. We're just feeding the beast. We live in a society that's self-centered anyway. It's all about I, me, or my. It's all about me, and that's it. And then we say, hey, go do whatever makes you feel good, whatever makes you feel right, whatever is, makes you happy, go do that. You're just feeding the beast. We do that in our own life. We become so self-centered and think that I deserve all of these things and I have all of these privileges that are mine and I should hang on to them. The amazing thing about Christ is He didn't hang on to any of the privileges He had. It's an amazing statement Paul makes in chapter 2, verse 7. He emptied himself. I mean, he can't even, he can't come up with a stronger and more intensive expression of the completeness of Christ's self-renunciation. He emptied himself and he became in the form of a bondservant. There was nothing selfish about that act. Nothing. And so Paul says you need to have this attitude and it needs to be a Christ-centered focus. Man, if you're going to deal with the issue of relationships, you need to be focused on Christ, not only in circumstances, but also in relationships. And you need to have the attitude of Christ. And he lays out several things in regards to Christ here in chapter 2, verses 6 and following. Notice this. Verse 6, who although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality of God a thing to be grasped. He was existing in the form of God. Three expressions that he uses here. The amazing thing is that he, it's translated here that he existed, and it sounds past tense that he was, but then somehow his deity changed. And that is what Paul is dealing with here, the issue of Christ's deity. But really the center word up here, it's a present participle. He is continuously existing or really being. And the amazing thing is that if you look at the progression of the passage, notice with me, if we move from verse 6 to verse 7, verse 7 is when he takes on human nature, right? His incarnation. So this present participle exists all the way through. So even when he took on human nature, he was continuously existing as God. He was fully deity. He didn't lose any of his deity when he took on his humanity. He is fully God and fully man. 
But it's amazing the statement that comes in regards to this. And, and we talk about the issue of what he did and what was his attitude. Notice verse 6. Who, although he exists in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. It wasn't something to be greedily hung on to, selfishly clung to. In other words, he saw his rights and privileges as something to be set aside for the sake of other people. This was his attitude. It wasn't self-centered. It was selfless and self-sacrificing for the sake of somebody else, for the sake of us. Paul says this is the ultimate example for your life and relationships. You want to have relationships that are right, relationships that are the way that they ought to be. If you want to have the right relationship, you need to be focused on Christ. It's interesting I do that. Now, we were talking with someone just recently because that's usually where I begin. If there is some discord between my wife and I, that's the first place I start. How's my relationship with Christ? You see, if I could picture it as a pyramid, if I'm here, my wife is here. As long as we both keep growing towards Christ, we're going to keep growing closer and closer to each other. Right? But what happens if I'm growing and she doesn't? All of a sudden, there's this great divide between us. And usually if someone isn't going towards Christ, they're going the opposite direction because there's no static existence. You either are or you aren't, right? The same thing with my children. If I have conflict with my kids, I have to stop and ask myself, all right, am I right with Christ? And even when I correct their behavior, I still have to check myself because sometimes I realize they're just getting it from me, right? And it's got to start and I've got to change first. Then I got to go talk to them about what they're doing. But he's the center of everything, and he needs to be the focus, not only in our circumstances, but also in our relationships. It's all about magnifying Christ, not merely in the, in the situations of life, but in the relationships that we have. It is so that he is exalted. He is magnified. He gives us the paradigm, and it's right here. And Paul says, you need to have the same kind of disposition that Christ had, and you have to have the same kind of attitude. He didn't take this equality with God, something to be selfishly hung on to. He had a radically different outlook. Do you realize that Christianity is the only belief whose God humbled himself and died? It's amazing because it's such a selfless belief, isn't it? The very core of our belief is all about selflessness. That's why I think it's amazing when the world claims that we're trying to force our views and everything and our beliefs down their throat when all we want to do is the best for them, right? We want to see them restored to God. I mean, how better can you, you strive in regards to someone's life is that they're right with Almighty God and have a relationship with Him. They experience all the blessings that He has. But notice this. This Christ attitude in verse 6 leads to Christ's service in verse 7. Paul's going to lay out several things for us in this verse, but it's not enough to think in the abstract. It's not sufficient. And we can do that. We can think, well, I'm thoughtful towards other people. But just thinking about them isn't enough. I mean, how many times do we do that? You know, I, I was thinking about you, and I was going to, but I didn't. Paul says thinking it is not enough. The attitude is not enough. You need to do something about it. It must result in action. It's not enough just to think about each other. You need to express that, and Christ did that. He put it into action. He emptied himself, laying aside the independent use of his own attributes as God. He permanently became a human and sinless physical body. He used that body to be a servant, and then he took that body to the cross and willingly died. See, that's why it's beautiful, because it's not just an issue of thought. It's about an attitude. It's about a disposition that drives you to action. You do something about it. It's about serving others, and that's what Paul challenges us to do. When you look at the Gospels, that's all we see Christ doing, right? He's just serving other people. He even makes this statement about himself in Matthew chapter 20, verse 28. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. I'm not here to be served by others. I'm here to serve you. I mean, think of all the people that he ministered to. Fishermen, harlots, tax collectors, the sick, the sorrowing. He was there for everybody. I was just reading this morning with Jairus' daughter. Right? Jairus' daughter, she's dying. Jairus comes and gets Jesus, right? And this is after a long period of, of ministry and everything else going on through the day, right? And he comes and Jairus' 
comes and gets him and they're heading out and this woman, all the crowds are pressing in on him and the woman touches the hem of his garment and she's healed, right? Because she has the issue of blood. And Jesus stops to deal with this woman and to draw her faith and confession of her faith out from her. And then he goes on to Jairus' home. He always had time for people. Always had time for people. And it was about ministering to their needs. I mean, it still amazes me when I read Luke's gospel and the fact that when he encountered the lepers, that he reached out his hand and touched them. I mean, from a physician, that's a powerful statement. And Luke was a doctor, right? It's interesting because he, he records this in the end of chapter 4 of his gospel that there were all those many who were sick who were coming to Jesus and he touched each one of them. It wasn't about being served. It was about serving. In the epitome of the example that he gave us when he put on the apron of a slave and he got down and washed the disciples' feet. You see, the amazing thing is that we think we're something, don't we? I mean, we really do. If we were honest in our value, we think we're pretty something. We really do. You know what? Jesus really was something. He really was someone. Far more than we even understand that he was, but he laid all of that aside, not to be served, but to serve. Somehow it's not enough just to have the attitude. Somehow we have to move into action. And not only that, he goes from service to sacrifice. Chapter 2, verse 8. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. I was thinking about this because, you know, we can be thoughtful towards other people and we can even serve them, but sometimes, you know, I don't think there's sacrifice involved. I, I just, I give you this thought. Many are willing to serve others as long as it doesn't cost them anything, right? I mean, so often we do for other people out of our surplus, don't we? Out of our surplus of possessions, out of our surplus of money, out of our surplus of time. Someone says to you, you know, can you help me? Well, I, I'm free that day, sure. Oh, yeah, I've got the afternoon open. Yeah, I can, I'll come and help you. I've got nothing going on this week. Sure, we can do that. And so we have no trouble doing that because it doesn't cost us anything. But as soon as we start talking about price, all of a sudden, all interest is lost. All of a sudden, you go, wait, it's going to cost me something? You mean that, I, oh, my schedule is full and I have to rearrange everything just for so-and-so so I can be there for them? See, now we move into the realm of Christ. You see, it's not just enough to think and to do so out of our surplus. Somehow it's got to cost us something. There are a few people I know in, in my life, there are a few people I know. If I called them and said, I need this, they'd say when and what time. I know that. Matter of fact, I just know that if I call them, they're there. No questions asked. Could people say that about us? That they are, we are there no matter what? That we are willing, as he says in chapter 2, verse 3, that we're willing to put aside selfishness, empty conceit, all these things with humility of mind regarding one another is more important than themselves. Verse 4, do not, and it merely is here in italics because it's not in the original, do not look out for your own personal interests. See, it wasn't Christ's example that he set for us. It was all about the benefit he brought to the lives of other people. And, and, and I know we do this. I and mean, we could just think of thousands of reasons why not to. You know, I think of in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 6, Sermon on the Mount, give to everyone who asks. We, we hear statements like that and we can think of a thousand reasons why we can't. I just wish sometime we would think of a thousand reasons why we can. We can have people calling us in a need and we need to be there for them. We can think of a thousand reasons why I can't be there. Oh, I've got this and I've got this obligation and this responsibility. You have a responsibility to serve one another. I 
So we should know in the body of Christ, we could be able to call anyone in the body of Christ and know that they are there no matter what. But the shame of it is, it's not true. Because Christ is not the ultimate focus in our relationships. And we're not concerned with magnifying His name and exalting Him. And taking advantage of those opportunities when we serve others to magnify the name of Christ. Interesting thought. Christ didn't just die as a martyr. He died as a Savior. He willingly gave His life up. It wasn't merely something that happened to Him. He gave it up on His own. And I just ask this question. Is it costing us anything to be a Christian? And this is just for you to, to think on in your own hearts and minds before God. Is it costing us anything to be a Christian? It's interesting, I was thinking about William Borden back in the early 1900s and before then. William Borden, he had a, a desire to minister to the people in Egypt. And it's interesting because he had, and this will tell you the time period when he, he, had, he had graduated from Princeton Seminary in Yale. Very wealthy family. His parents sent him on a trip around the world. He's accompanied by an older man, a believer. He traveled the world, and during that time, God worked on his heart, softened his heart towards those who were in destitute and poverty situations. And he had such a longing to minister to them and to bring them the good news about Jesus Christ. It was interesting when he came back to the States, God continued to work on his heart. When he was in Chicago, in the back streets of Chicago, God continued to soften his heart. And he had such a passion for the widows and orphans and those who were destitute and ministering to their needs. And during that time, it was, it was a time of development and, and really, if you will, training for him to go over to Egypt. When he finally made it to Egypt in 1913, he contracted cerebral meningitis and he died at the age of 25. The amazing thing is that almost every major newspaper in the U.S. at that time recorded his story as a great testimony to his life for Christ. And the world can think about and the world would say, you know what, that's a waste. What a waste. You know, as a generation, they were challenged by the fact that they need to be living life with eternal values, that Christ needed to be the focus. And he was enough to suffer and give himself for I don't think that we are allowing ourselves to be pushed as far as we can be pushed in our relationships to other people and serving sacrificially for the sake of someone else. Is Christianity costing us anything? Because if it's not, maybe we need to start rethinking how our life is and what our focus is. Christ's glorification of the Father. I, I find this amazing because when you go through this passage, in chapter 2, he, he talks about the humiliation of Christ, verses 7 and 8. Then he moves in verse 9 to talk about the exaltation of Christ. And usually that's sort of where we end with this passage. And we forget this very last statement at the end of it all. But read with me chapter 2, verses 9 and following. For this reason also God highly exalted him, bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Now notice this, and this is the one phrase so often gets forgotten, to the glory of God the Father. That's what it's all about. When you think about the purpose of Christ's humiliation and exaltation, it was about the glorification of God the Father. That even in His exaltation, it was selfless. It's all about the glorification of the Father, not me. See, everything about his life was selflessness. Everything about his life was giving up his rights and privileges for the sake of others. Everything about his life was about service. Everything about his life was about everybody else. Paul says you've got to live a Christ-centered life gives three human examples, himself, Timothy, and Epaphroditus. But the ex ultimate example of a selfless life is Christ. 
it's not just about this season. It's about every day of our life. And we talk about now being a time to really focus on Christ, but so is every moment of our life a time to be focused on Christ. We have to make sure that we maintain that focus throughout life, whether it's the circumstances or relationships. It's all about Christ. It's all about Christ. And that is the challenge. And I pray that that is the challenge, not from now, but when we walk into this next new year, that this is the commitment of our life for the next year, is that we are going to keep Christ in focus. And everything that we do, so that whether it's in the situations or in our relationships, we can magnify our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to the glory of God the Father. Amen? Let's pray. Robert, would you close in a word of prayer, please?